Well, good evening. I hope you had a good afternoon. And um, good grief. Everybody's sitting on the back. Thank you for not sitting on the back door, guys. It's a great golf fix between me and you. <laughs> We're in uh, Mark chapter 3 tonight. Mark chapter number 3. Um, yeah, I'm excited about our missions conference coming up and just, um, just uh, t- talking about the gospel and the gospel going to all the nations, the, the, the uh, nations of the world, the challenges uh, that these different people, groups face around the world. I was um, reading, it was one of the stands, they had 9 million people there, and I think it was like Uzbekistan, one of the stand countries. 9 million people, it's the size of Alabama, and there's 30 Christians there. Imagine being one of those 30 Christians. So there's more believers in this room tonight than there are in the whole nation. And then also, uh, you know, the kind of persecution that uh, you would face and the hostilities that you would face just by uh, the the people there in your nation. Uh, Saracenos, aren't they out of Calvary? Yeah. And so praise the Lord for that. I mean, so Calvary's our parent church. I did not know that. Um, so close relationship there, and uh, they've been doing a fabulous job there in New Mexico from uh, all reports that I've heard. And it, it had been you know, slow going like uh, most missionaries, but they've gotten into that community there, and I understand that they're doing a tremendous job uh, with the Native Americans there in New Mexico. Uh, so we're in Mark chapter number 3, and um, we're going to look at verse number 22 down through verse number 30 tonight. It's good to have Curtis Baker with us tonight, the Brad's older and wiser, younger and something wiser. I introduced, I introduced Curtis, I can't remember who, to Tom Stiles or something, and, um, and, I, and I said to Tom, I said, this is Brad Baker's brother, and Brad is the normal one in the family. I was, te- I was teasing them both, and oh no, no! But Curtis just took a church, and where Farmington? Farmington. What's what's the uh, um, name of your church? Faith Baptist. Faith Baptist. So pray for him and hope. I mean, they're launching out and trying to uh, just revitalize that church there, and so they've got a wonderful opportunity. So be praying for them. And, uh, and Curtis is from this area, and uh, so I'm just excited about that church and. Uh, the future of that church there. So pray for them. Uh, Put them on your prayer list. So Luke chapter 3 and verse number 22. And uh, when you find your place there, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Luke 3, 22. Did I say Luke? Mark. Mark 3, 22. Mark 3, 22, it says there, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said, He hath an unclean spirit. Uh, And tonight we'll be talking about a blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. This was our text from this morning, uh, but we're drawing out these verses here. Remember that uh, if you're going to serve the Lord, if you're going to live the Christ life, if you're going to live the life that Jesus Christ lived, 
uh, that you will be opposed, that you will have adversaries. Uh, and the Lord's adversaries were of three different locales or uh, three different groups of people here in our text. Uh, one were his friends. His friends came uh, and said that he is beside himself. Uh, they wanted to seize him, really to, to take him away because they were worried about him, that he was putting himself into danger. Uh, and then his family came. Remember, this family w were without and they were calling to him. Uh, and then the Lord there defined who his family was. Uh, there are those that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. Uh, and then his foes, the Lord's foes opposed him here. Uh, and they attributed his work. They couldn't deny his power. They couldn't deny his miracles. Uh, but they attributed his work to Satan, which would be blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Tonight we'll look at this. We're going to look at a few other places in the Word of God. We'll talk about uh, God's deadlines. And uh, there's different deadlines that we can cross. Two of them have to do uh, with unbelievers, people who do not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And one of them has to do uh, with believers. And we'll look at these deadlines this evening. Uh, so let's go, Lord, in, in prayer and ask God's blessing and help. Uh, and uh, pray that He would illuminate our minds and give us understanding hearts tonight as we look into the Scriptures. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the privilege it is to look into the eternal truth of God's Word. Amen. Lord, we thank you that our, we have an anchor for our soul. We have a final authority. Uh, we have a resting place. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we can come together uh, by way of the Holy Spirit together tonight uh, and just unify around the Word of God. Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless us as we look into your Word. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we just look into weighty matters of Scripture. We talk about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. We talk about sin unto death and these things. I pray that you give us understanding hearts and may we just... Uh, just uh, look at you tonight in reverential fear. I pray that you would help us just to examine our own hearts and our own lives. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So remember when the Lord said He, he would uh, come and set at variance he would come and divide households. There's going to be those even of your own household uh, that will be divided against you if you choose to go uh, along with Christ, if you choose to be a Christian. Uh, if you get saved, let's say if you got saved like I did at the age of 22, uh, you've been living a certain way, you've been conformed to uh, the course of this world, uh, and uh, the friends and the companions that you have partnership with, you walk in lockstep with them, uh, and then the Lord... Um, he reaches down, He saves you, you're born again from above, you're taken out of Satan's family, you're placed into God's family, uh, and if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, you start walking to the beat of a different drum, uh, and so you have to remember with your old friends, who changed, you or them? You did. Uh, and so you would have to understand that uh, you're walking in partnership, and, and friendship is really an alliance, uh, you're really, uh, you know, one of the one of the most important things that you can uh, teach your children is to have uh, social intelligence because how far you get in life has directly to do with how much people like you. It doesn't have as much to do with your intelligence or anything else. Uh, and so you, you make these friendships, you make these partnerships, and then you start walking a different direction of your friends. I remember when I first got saved, you know, I, I uh, you know, felt, uh, felt guilty, you know, and felt like I was forsaken people. Uh, who had helped me out in life, uh, and I'm heading a different direction. It wasn't like I was against my friends, but uh, they were going one way, and I was going another way. And you wonder, uh, you know, am I going to have any more friendships or partnerships? But what, what, uh, what happens when you're born again into God's family? Uh, not only are you in connection with the Lord, God gives you a new family, and He gives you a new group of people to walk together with, can to walk together except they be agreed. And so uh, this new group of people, uh, not only are we in the same, uh, we're in the same lo locale uh, physically, uh, we're in the same state uh, mentally or emotionally, but then also blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. 
I am born again by the Holy Spirit. I can talk to Brother Daryl about the Lord. I talk about the things of the Lord. And uh, he understands we're speaking the same language. Uh, if we're in a public sector and there's other unsaved people there, they could not understand what him and I were talking about. We're speaking our own uh, language, the Christian language. This is called Christian fellowship. And then we have partnership. And so you will go through different trials and temptations, uh, and you will go through different struggles. You will go through persecution. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you will live godly in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. Uh, so if you never suffer for the name of Christ, you ought to ask yourself, why? Uh, moving parts create friction, right? Uh, you know, we yeah. salmon fishing here. Brother Paul, 2nd and 3rd of October. And um, dead salmon float downstream. They're just a part of the river. Yeah. Salmon that are alive swim upstream. And, and guess what uh, you and I are doing as Christians? Peter, when he's preaching at Pentecost, uh, he says to them, he says, uh, repent of this untoward generation. So untoward, meaning the world is moving away from God and you are moving towards God. And so the crowd's going this way and you are going upstream and there is going to be a rub. There is going to be uh, friction. There is going to be a lot of hard times. Uh, I read a couple books on vacation uh, and um, one of them was apologetics book. Then another book I read it in uh, every once in a while a book comes along that you feel like it was written for you. It was written to you. I want to call up the author and say, thank you for writing this book. It was phenomenal. It was so good. It was about Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I've read several books on Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I had to take three credit hours for my seminary degree about Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I had to read 1,500 pages plus of books and then read hundreds of Sword in the Trial uh, magazine articles. But Charles Haddon Spurgeon was an amazing, amazing preacher. He could have been some sort of itinerant evangelist. He could have been like a, a Charles G. Finney or, a, you know, one of the Second Great Awakening preachers that just went around and just preached and converted people and then just left them to be. But instead, he was a pastor and he was a shepherd and he watched over people's souls. And so this book that was read, uh, or this book that was written that I read, is called Spurgeon as Pastor. And it was just all, about 230 pages about Charles Haddon Spurgeon uh, and the uh, Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle uh, there in London, England, the church that he pastored uh, and the many thousands of people that he pastored and how he watched over them and how he cared for their souls and how uh, they took into number and they knew exactly who their members were. And if you were a member, uh, you got tickets and you punched them at communion. And if you weren't coming to communion, uh, one of the elders of the church was going to look you up and find out why you were not there. Uh, and <laughs> And, and, uh, and they were going to determine what to do from there. Uh, most of their meetings, they were voting in members, voting out of members. Uh, and Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he, he fought some great battles. Uh, I mean, he, he wasn't, uh, wasn't mean, wasn't nasty, but sometimes he just drew the line uh, in certain areas. I mean, he would cooperate with different people we wouldn't cooperate with today. Uh, the guy who filled his pulpit more than anybody else, A.T. Pearson, uh, was a... Uh, baby sprinkled Presbyterian uh, from America come and fill Spurgeon's pulpit. Uh, and so that he would associate with some people that we would not associate with. Uh, but then there were some sins of society uh, that he would have, have absolutely nothing to do with. I was reading about how that in 1860 he wrote a open letter to an American publication uh, and it was about the, uh, the American slave trade uh, and he said, I would, I would much rather co cooperate with an adulterer or I would cooperate with, uh, with a murderer than I would with a man stealer. He said, no man stealer will ever uh, preach in the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle. Well, um, you know where most Baptists are? In the South. And, um, and, and, and he supported, he gave, gave over $100 million dollars 
of his own money because he was so prolific and wrote so much and his, his books went everywhere. And what he would do is support all the different ministries there at the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle. And the ministry that he supported from all of his writings to the United States uh, was Spurgeon's College. And, and so he would support the Bible college students in his church with the sales to America. And uh, when he wrote that letter, the sales dropped so tremendously that he thought he was going to have to close the college. And they had to take up special offerings there at that church. And they had to rearrange uh, the way that they paid for their own college. Um, and so wow. that stuff was going on. We talk about human trafficking. Well, there's been a whole lot of it gone on underneath our country. Uh, Henry Ward Beecher, who was Lyman Beecher, the famous Puritan's uh, son, Henry Ward Beecher pastored uh, in New York City, and he, and he, uh, he, would, he, would, uh, he pastored uh, down in Brooklyn, New York, and every, uh, every Sunday there would be the Beecher boats. And they would uh, go across the Hudson River there in New York City, and they would go to hear Henry Ward Beecher. Henry Ward Beecher, many times on Sunday morning, would raise $2,000 to buy a mulatto slave woman off the slave trade because they were bought uh, to be put into sexual work. $2,000. And that was would be equivalent of tens of thousands of dollars in our day and age. And here they are uh, fighting it on, uh, on Sunday mornings. And so Spurgeon fought these battles, but he always had his family. He always had his church family. The greatest battle that uh, Charles Spurgeon would ever face in his ministry was what was called a downgrade controversy. He was getting up in years. I mean, he was really old. I mean, he was uh, 50 and so he was kind of getting antiquated in his techniques and, you know, in his style. And then it was the age of modernity. It was the late 1800s. And there was uh, telegraph and tele, uh, I think telephone was right on the edge. And there was electricity and modern man was figuring out things like germs. Uh, and then all these, uh, all these things like uh, redemption and blood sacrifice and um, vicarious suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ and all these things. Um, I mean, they were good for the Puritans, and they were good uh, for the former days. Uh, but uh, modern man is not going to go for that. Modern man believes in science. Okay, this is what we call the age of modernity. Uh, and so there's about 1,400 Baptist churches in the Baptist Union in England. And these 1,400 churches, Charles Spurgeon in his sword in the trial was writing against the downgrade of doctrine amongst Baptist churches during this day. They were downgrading Bible doctrines in Scripture, saying they're not for this time period anymore. They're going to be stressed. Uh, you know, the, the principles are what matter. More of a social gospel type feel to these churches. And Spurgeon railed against this. And... These churches got together, and <laughs> I'll tell you the story behind the church that they met. It was at um, Joseph Parker's church, and Charles Spurgeon headed out with Joseph Parker. But Joseph Parker called in these men, and they voted Charles Spurgeon out of that denomination. And what broke Charles, is, Ch Charles' heart is his brother, who was his co-pastor for 22 years together with him, James, voted against his brother, and Charles Spurgeon was voted out of the Baptist Union uh, there in England. And then, four years later, he died. And his wife would say to her dying day that it was that downgrade, uh, that, that, that controversy that killed her husband. Uh, remember something about the Lord is that he was a man of sorrows and he was acquainted with grief. And if our Lord, when he was here on this earth, that there, there was times where he would have to weep over the city of Jerusalem and he would weep over people who would be uh, destroyed. Uh, and he said that I would uh, gather thee as a hen doth gather her brood, but you would not. 
uh, that if he was if he was acquainted with uh, sufferings and he he saw people reject him, uh, you and I will see the same things. Uh, here in this portion of scripture, uh, the Lord here was accused of being in league with Satan. Again, um, you know, if people can't um, deny your results or your ministry, they're going to question your motives and then also the means by which you do the things that you do, saying uh, that, uh, well, you know, he just does it or she just does it for attention or she just, and also, well, it's really not a work of the Lord. Uh, and what they do with the, with the Lord here is they attribute his work to Satan. In verse number 29, it says, uh, but he that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Look, if you will, to Matthew chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12, and um, look at verse number 31. Matthew 12, 31, and here's the other record of this same account. Uh, I want you to notice what the Lord says here. Matthew 12, 31, it says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So there's an unforgivable, unforgivable, or we'd say an unpardonable sin here that will not be forgiven in this world or in the world to come. Um, I want you to notice here that this sin is a sin committed with the mouth. Verse number 33. It says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. O generation of vipers, can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that a man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. It says in James 3, 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. So you see here in Mark chapter number 3 and in Matthew chapter number 12, uh, what the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost was is taking the Holy Ghost and attributing the work of the Holy Ghost to Satan. And they were saying that uh, whatever the Lord did it was a result of Satan's work. It was not a result of what the Holy Spirit uh, did. We see other portions of Scripture that talk about this as well. Uh, Belteshazzar, if you remember that he took uh, the, the golden utensils uh, th from the, the treasury that were in the temple, brought to Babylon from Jerusalem, uh, and he praised the gods of gold, the gods of silver, uh, and blasphemed the God of heaven. And they were having a drunken party there in Babylon. And then there was a handwriting on the wall across the deadline. Meanie, meanie, tackle you farson. I don't know why I can, rem I always re can remember that, but uh, meanie, meanie, tackle you farson. Thou art found in the balances and found wanting. And it says, and that night the king died. Um, Acts chapter number 12. Herod. I think people are placating him. I can't imagine people really thinking that uh, Herod was an angel, if you read anything about him, but he gave some sort of uh, oration, and then he sat there, uh, and they said, this is the voice of an angel. This is the voice of a God. Uh, and it says that he gave not God the glory, and an angel came down, and immediately he was smitten with worms. That was it. 
everything was done. He had spoke in a word against his own soul, uh, and it was all over. Uh, there's a famous sermon. The guy, uh, J. Harold Smith, uh, preached a sermon hundreds of times, perhaps a thousand times, called God's Three Deadlines. I took his title tonight, too. And um, God's three deadlines, and there really are theologically three different deadlines in the Bible, and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is one. He tells sensational story after sensational story uh, about being in different meetings and preaching, and uh, talks about a young man he goes back to. Uh, he saw him coming into the tent meeting late, uh, and he says, young man, he said, I come back here. I really feel like the Holy Spirit sent me back here to talk to you. Uh, and he said, let me tell you something, mister. I'm here to pick up a girl, and uh, I want nothing to do with this meeting. You and the Holy Spirit can go. Ooh, man. And he said that that uh, young man hopped on his motorcycle. Uh, 30 seconds later, he was hit by a car right out in front of the tent meeting. Again, story after story after wow. story after story, uh, and you would have to watch or uh, listen, you look it right up on YouTube, uh, and, and there's a sin against the Holy Spirit that once committed, it's a deadline, it is over, it is done. Uh, here's, here is one of the reasons why, and we can only speculate that, why is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit an unpardonable sin? Jesus said that you can blaspheme Him, you can blaspheme the Father, but if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, it shall never be forgiven you. Jesus, when He was on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Uh, in the book of Acts, uh, we see there that uh, as, as Peter was preaching, he said, if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. There was a sin of ignorance in there when they were blaspheming, when they were scoffing uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in, but um, they did not know what they were doing, and it was forgivable. Uh, turn, if you will, to uh, Hebrews chapter number 6. Hebrews chapter number 6. We'll look at Hebrews again, but uh, Hebrews chapter number 6, the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews and is telling them to continue on uh, to better things. The theme of the book of Hebrews is better things. Uh, it talks about how all of the Old Testament sacrifices are all types, shadows, figures of him who is to come, uh, that the Sabbath day that they recognize every, every single week uh, had been fulfilled uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ, that you can enter into his rest, that he was sacrificed once and for all, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, that he's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, uh, so you should press forward uh, to him. Verse uh, chapter 6 and then look, look down, if you will, um, in, into verse number 4. It says, For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open Shame, uh, For the earth which drinketh in the rain, and cometh oft upon it, and drinketh forth herbs, meat for them, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Um, but, look at verse number 9. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, Though we thus speak, uh, it is impossible for those who are enlightened, those who have tasted the eternal gift, those who have seen the Son of God uh, crucified afresh and having turned away. And so these men who had blasphemed the Holy Ghost in Mark chapter number 3 and in Matthew chapter number 12, they had the witness of John the Baptist. They had the witness of the Father. They had the witness of the Holy Spirit. Amen. They had the witness of the miracles. They had the witness of the Word of God, which the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching everywhere he, he went. Uh, the Lord had this platform of signs there. Uh, the Lord said that uh, you have experienced me. You have experienced me through the Holy Spirit. 
uh, and the Holy Spirit is it uh, the, the sweet succor of God which woos every man uh, to come in to him uh, as the voice is calling out in the street, uh, come unto me all the ends of the earth and be saved. And you're taking the sweet Holy Spirit, the still small voice that's reaching out to you and you are saying it is not the voice of God, it is indeed the voice of Satan. And because you sin against this avenue, there is no possibility for your salvation. Have you ever talked to somebody that um, was worried that they had blasphemed the Holy Spirit, that they had committed the unpardonable sin? Raise your hand. Let me ask you a question. If the Holy Spirit is the wooing voice of God, if the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts you of your sin and shows you the need for the Savior, if you were worried about whether or not you committed uh, the unpardonable sin, have you committed the unpardonable sin? No. Sir. no. Uh, you see something similar in Romans chapter number 1. Uh, it says, they did not want to retain the knowledge of God in their mind, so therefore God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Um, I was reading about Vice President Aaron Burr. Remember Aaron Burr? Uh, he would have been President of the United States. I don't think he was a very good man. I know he's very, very immoral. Uh, he was married, however, to Jonathan Edwards, I think, great-granddaughter. Uh, but he's the one who ch challenged Alexander Hamilton to a duel. Yeah. And I was reading about him. He said, I made God a, long, a deal a long time ago. If uh, he left me alone, I would leave him alone. And he has kept his end of the bargain, and I have kept mine. Very scary. Uh, and so someone who is blaspheming the Holy Spirit is saying to God, leave me alone. I do not want to retain the knowledge of God in my mind. And so God gives them up over to a reprobate mind. And so the first deadline you see in Scripture is this unpardonable sin. Uh, number two deadline that you see in the Bible um, is, is sinning away your day of grace. Turn, if you will, to Proverbs chapter number one. Proverbs chapter number one. Proverbs chapter number one and... Look at verse number 24. It says, Because I have called, and ye have refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all of my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Uh, verse number 26, when John Newton, amazing grace, yep. you know, uh, that John Newton, slave trader, is on the ship, and he's about to be capsized in the ocean, terrible storm. He, rem he remembered this verse that his mother made him memorize when he was a boy. And uh, what a good verse to have your son memorize. Look at this. Um, verse 26. I, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. This was going through his mind as the ship, what he thought was going down. And he cried out unto the Lord. Uh, remember Psalm chapter number two? Uh, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Uh, the kings of the earth gather themselves together and say, let us cast his bands asunder. He that sitteth in the heavens shall... Laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. He is going to make a mockery of them. But I want you to notice what the Lord is doing. Lady Wisdom, uh, Wisdom is personified as a woman in Proverbs, uh, but she is calling out in the street to whosoever shall come unto her. She's calling out in the streets, and here it says, You refused. You refused. Wisdom. Look at Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. In verse number 1. Proverbs 29, it says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck, 
shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Um, so the Lord calls and calls and calls again, and a person says that I will harden my heart. I will stiffen my neck. I will not listen to this voice. It says then suddenly that person will be uh, cut off in that without remedy. We see this again in Proverbs that there's a sudden destruction. Uh, remember, remember Sodom and Gomorrah? What did, did the Lord shoot a few Roman candles yep. out before? This is just a warning. Uh, no, there, there was angels sent in. There was a testimony. There was the witness. Uh, there was righteous Lot right in the middle. And the Lord goes and, and gets the righteous out of the city. And then in one day, destruction fell. Uh, we think about uh, Noah in the ark. Uh, didn't rain a few raindrops before uh, Noah got in on the ark. It was once he got in, they shut the door, and then there was sudden calamity. Uh, in the book of Proverbs, um, wine is mocker, strong drink is raging, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Uh, it says, at last it biteth like an adder and stingeth like a serpent. So I don't say necessarily first drink, the first time get drunk, or the third time, or the fourth time, or the fifth, or whatever. It says, eventually, suddenly, the destruction will come. Uh, it says the same thing about the strange woman. Okay? So the strange woman is not strange because she's weird. She's strange because she does not belong to you. And he says, at the last, till a dart strike through his liver. How does destruction come? It comes suddenly. And so in verse number 1 of Proverbs 29, it says, He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without uh, remedy. Uh, turn to Hebrews chapter number 2. Back to Hebrews chapter number 2. Hebrews 2, look at verse number 3. It says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? How shall we escape? Escape what? Destruction. Uh, what does saved mean? Did you say saved? Uh, this is at the fair booth several times. So when we say saved, uh, what does it mean to be saved? Like if your house is on fire and I came in and took you out, I could say, I saved you. Saved you from what? The fire. Saved you from destruction. Uh, salvation is salvation from something. It is salvation from destruction. Remember uh, John 3, 36, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but... The wrath of God abideth upon him. How shall we escape if we neglect? Uh, and so we know from this portion of Scripture that there are certain people that are not saved and they know that they are not saved and the Holy Spirit of God is dealing with them. Um, I was 22 and I got saved. I've said that about 10,000 times in my life. Um, and people say, did, did, you, did you know that you were not saved? No, I never knew I was not saved because I was saved right up here in my mind. Okay, I could have told you the Romans road. We've all sinned, it's the price on sin. Uh, Jesus paid the price, heaven's a free gift, received a free gift. Knew all of that, okay? And so I was 100% saved in my mind. Now, I knew I just couldn't do the things that I was supposed to do and I was just Jack being Jack. This is just who I am. That was a true statement. I was an unsaved, lost sinner who had no strength, uh, no possibility, possible way to live the Christian life apart from Jesus Christ. But when I was 22, the Holy Spirit came, and the night of my salvation, there is a day of salvation. We're going to look here in just a minute. Uh, but there's a day of salvation. The Holy Spirit came uh, and convicted me. And you know what I said when the Holy Spirit says, Jack, repent. And that's what it was. 
get down on my knees and tell the Lord, I was sorry. I was his enemy. I was fighting against him. Okay? Me and the Lord were doing war, and I was really, really foolish. It's kind of, it's kind of like when your little brother's fighting, and you can hold him off with one finger, and he's swinging at you. That was me. Fighting against the Lord, I realized if he squished me like a bog, he, he, I deserved it. And he was just in doing so. And I agreed with God about my sin. I said, yes, Lord, I am worthy of death. I'm worthy of hell. I'm worthy of eternal torment. And you are a just God. And I am sorry. Lord, save me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peace and joy. First time. Tears come down my face. Experiencing the joy of the Lord, the darkness becomes light. But there's some people perhaps in this room that you know you're not saved. And the Holy Spirit is dealing with you. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Your destruction will come suddenly. You will be cut off. And that, it says, without Remedy. There is a deadline coming uh, for those who are neglectful of salvation. And so sinning away the day of grace. Look at your wealth to verse number 6, same chapter, Hebrews 2. But in one certain place he testifies, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou hast visited him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor, and thou hast set him over the works of thy hands. Uh, what is man that thou hast visited him? Look, if you will, to Hebrews 10, and look at verse number 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of the judgment and the fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be wrought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So he's saying, how much more have you and I been given? And let me tell you something, uh, is that you and I tonight are way more accountable uh, than the people in the Old Testament underneath Moses, way more. We've been given so much more. Uh, we've been given more revelation. We're on this side of the cross. We all know all about the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, the last chapter of the Bible has been written. Uh, we, we know uh, what can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Uh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is a flow. That makes me white as snow. And he says, how much more sore shall your punishment be? Those died who thumbed their nose at Moses' law. Well, you got something more important than Moses' law. You got the blood of Jesus Christ and you know it's cleansing power. And if you trample it underfoot, how much sore will your punishment be? Uh, one thing that we know about hell uh, is that when we get judged, uh, I shouldn't say we, praise God. Uh, when the unsaved, the unsaved dead stand before God yeah. in Revelation chapter number 20, one of the things that they will be judged for uh, is their, um, their accessibility to the knowledge of the gospel. Now, there's not going to be one single person that is without excuse, Romans chapter number one, mm -hmm. Right? But some of us have had far more revelation than others. Yes, some of us have um, grown up in it, uh, been around in it, uh, been surrounded with saved people, been surrounded with people who uh, know the Lord. Remember what the Lord said about his hometown, Capernaum? Thou hast been lifted up to heaven. Thou shalt be cast down into hell It'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment 
A lot of times we look at Sodom and Gomorrah, the worst of the worst of the worst. Well, God doesn't think so. He said that Capernaum was worse than Sodom and Gomorrah because they have been given more. So deadline number two, sing away your day of grace. There's a day appointed unto salvation. God forbid that we would sin against it. Number three deadline, there's a sin unto death. Turn, if you will, to 1 John, chapter number 5. 1 John, chapter number 5, and um, look at verse number 16. First John 5, 16. If any man see his brother sin. Now, the reason why it uses brother there is not, it doesn't talking about one of your genetic siblings. What's it talking about is a, uh, a family member of the household of faith. Uh, so this final sin, the first two, would have to do with uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Uh, a saved, born-again believer cannot uh, commit this sin. Uh, sending away your day of grace, if you have received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, you, you received Him, uh, that you cannot send away your day of grace. But this sin that is unto death, it says, if any man see his brother sin, this is a sin that I can commit, this is a sin that you can commit, and uh, say, what is this sin so that I might not do it? And I can do all other sins except for this one sin. Well, that's the neat thing about the Bible. There's a lot of mystery there that we are not privy to. And the Lord does not tell us what this is. But look here, verse number 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Uh, so you see your brother sinning, what are you supposed to do? Pray for him. Pray, 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 uh, and the Lord will give him life and give him repentance out of that sin. However, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. I mean, there is a sin that the brethren praying is not going to get you out of, is not going to deliver you from. Look at verse number 17. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. So verse number 16 again, let's look at this. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So this sin here, this talked about sin unto death. Again, we do not know what it is, but we can look at other portions of Scripture. I want to have you turn there, but if you want to write down 1 Corinthians 11, 29 through 31, I'll read it to you. Uh, and Paul says to the Corinthian church, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Right there. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verses 29 through 31. So here you're saying that uh, there's believers with unrepentant sin in the first degree in their life that they were holding on to. Uh, and the Apostle Paul makes this analogy, you cannot drink of the Lord's table and the table of devils. It's like you're hooking yourself up to two freight trains going two different directions, uh, and that the end result is going to be in your destruction. Uh, some of you are sick, he said, and then some of you are even dead uh, because you have taken of uh, the table unworthily. Um, Acts chapter number 5, verses 1 through 10. Um, Ananias and Sapphira. I, I believe uh, for sure that uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they were children of God. Amen, amen, amen. And remember that um, they lied to the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. 
How'd they do that? Sin with their mouth, right? Uh, they got in front of the church and praise the Lord. Just like Barnabas did in chapter 4, yeah. we're giving all, right? Uh, and uh, we sold the land and we're giving it all to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Aren't we some? And, uh, and then Sapphira called in, or Ananias, Ananias gets called in first. He dies. Sapphira gets called in. Uh, and she dies, and we see there are two different people that committed a sin and a sin unto death. Here's three things about the way God uh, works. God speaks to us through his word. Uh, Paul said, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Uh, so there is not some secret sin that you don't even know about that God is going to destroy you for. If you have a secret sin in your life that you know directly contradicts God in his word, what you need to do is repent Amen. of it Amen. and don't keep it hidden. Go before the Lord and confess it, forsake it, get the help that you need and get that out of your life. You don't want to be sick and you definitely don't want to be dead. So God speaks to us. He that hath ears, let him hear, right? Then God spanks. God speaks. God also spanks. One of the reasons why you know you're God's child is because every once in a while he takes ownership of you, whom the Lord loves. He chastens every son. Remember, just he says, like the earthly fathers, they did that for their own benefit, uh, and I can identify with that. Um, I, I want to like my children, okay? Therefore, I will discipline them to get them into uh, a model that I enjoy being around. And then also, I do not want them embarrassing me or anything else. And therefore, uh, I will raise them after my own image and my own likeness. I know I will raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Uh, but it says, your father's chasing you for a little while and you reverence them. Uh, but the Lord chastens us for our benefit. So the Lord speaks, the Lord spanks, he chastens. Hebrews 12, 6 and 7, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If we endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? And then finally, God speaks, God spanks, and then if that isn't sufficient, God separates. Remember, that God looks at death a whole lot different than you and I do, okay? Um, so I promise you this. Uh, if you have tonight, if you have some unrepentant sin in your life, sin in, in the first degree, um, you do it, you enjoy it, you know that God's word forbids it, but you're going to do it anyway, you're unrepentant of it, uh, it's hidden, it's tucked away in your life, uh, the Lord is going to rebuke you through his word. Uh, you can plug your ears and blah, 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 blah. I can't hear what you're saying, Lord. Uh, anytime that comes up, you're plugging your ears. Uh, then the Lord comes down from heaven and chastens you, and you harden your neck and just toughen up, and you say, I'm going to double down on this. It's mine, 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 my little, my little pet, my little hobby sin. Uh, and God looks down in mercy, and God looks down in love. And, you know, Brother Curtis, you know, I... You know, I always, I would say this, I've said this a ton of times. You know, if God, if I just die out of the blue, just figure that, um, that, that I was going to, I've asked the Lord this, you know, if I'm going to commit some sort of a sin that is going to bring shame on Christ, I'd much rather just get hit by a truck, <laughs> have a nice funeral, and everyone talk about how great a guy I was, Okay. Uh, than to bring reproach and bring shame on the name of Christ. You know, God said, Jack, go to your room. I've spanked you enough. You won't listen. I've, I've preached to you. You wouldn't listen. I spanked you. You wouldn't listen. Now go to your room. You get up to heaven. You're like, thank you, Lord, for delivering me from myself. Yeah. You know, dying and going to heaven is not as bad as you think. Yeah. Okay? But really, why would you want to die and go to heaven when you didn't have to, when you could have just repented of your sin, uh, and you could have just come before the Lord and asked for forgiveness and been restored. And again, what is that sin unto death? You study for a while, and you get back to me, and you tell me what it is. I don't know. Some sort of unrepentant 
sin, that we harden our neck, and we don't get it right with the Lord. So remember, three deadlines. One is blasphemy, the Holy Spirit. Another deadline is sinning away the day of grace. The Lord reaches out to you for salvation, reaches out to you for salvation. You slap his hand away, slap his hand away, slap his hand away. Another deadline is the deadline for the believer. There is a sin unto death, and let's all avoid that. So let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll have an invitation. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we, th we thank you for the warnings from Scripture. And Lord, help us to have wisdom. And Lord, help us to um, just live before you with godly fear that you are our Heavenly Father and that we should look at you with reverential awe. And Lord, I pray for each and every person here. I don't know the state of everybody's souls. You do. You know our hearts. You know those who have need of salvation. Uh, you know those here who have uh, a need of just repentance and they have some, something in their life they need to get rid of. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we talk to you about the things which we've heard tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for watching the sermon today. If you'd like to find out more information about our church, you can visit our church website at lbbc.info. If you'd like to email us, you can email us at mylbbc at gmail. I also have a website, pastorjack.org. You can sign up for my blog there. Uh, and then also we do have a podcast. It's called the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And you can find that on podcast apps. And you can also find that on YouTube. God bless you. Thanks again for watching. And we'll see you next time.